<laughs> hey everyone, welcome to Constructed Chaos. Today we're exploring the unbridled power of all things Eldritch, and all it'll cost you is your soul. So, you want all the magical goodness of being a spellcaster in Dungeons and Dragons, but with none of the studying or innate talent that's typically required. Well, you've come to the right place. All that's needed is a deal with a patron willing to share some small sliver of their own power with you. Just sign on the dotted line. <laughs> <laughs> but what kind of person typically makes a deal like this? Well, if you're going by the stats, races that get a boost in their charisma are often favorable choices. Things like Asimar, Tieflings, Changelings, and Half-Elves are always strong picks with a default plus two to your charisma score. But with so many races now set up to assign their bonuses as you see fit, and the optional rule from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that allows you to do the same with any races out there, this may not even be an issue. So when it comes to those other scores, what do Warlocks typically care about? Well, I've found success in most of my builds by following an order of Charisma as the highest stat for our spellcasting ability modifier, which will be 8 plus our proficiency plus our Charisma modifier, followed up by Constitution and Dexterity to help us out with hit points, maintaining concentration on spells, armor class, and initiative. Then following that by Intelligence, Strength, and Wisdom coming in last. One could make the argument for placing Wisdom higher up on the totem pole here since it does serve as an important stat for spell saving throws, but I'd argue that most people that make this kind of deal aren't all that wise, and really those last few stats could go in whatever order you choose if you think differently. You could even do something completely different if you want it. This is really just a suggestion for most Warlock builds. After all, Warlock is probably one of my favorite classes to use when I'm multiclassing. So sometimes just the bare minimum of 13 in your charisma is all that's needed to get a feature, spell, or ability that you're after from this class. I've got another video here that goes over all that as well as some common mistakes in case you're unfamiliar, but in this context you should keep in mind what drove your character into this deal even after becoming so powerful as another character class, or what drove you away from this deal you made into another way of life when you multiclassed out of Warlock. These sort of questions and your relationship with your patron are some of my favorite parts of playing a warlock because backstories, ideals, and goals develop themselves so easily off of this foundation. And as a DM, I love when my players create warlocks. It gives me a chance to interject story elements and adventure hooks through their patron to move the party forward with a compelling force that feels like part of their story and not just part of my campaign. But with all that said, let's get started at level one and get ready. It's a big old broken level one. Before we go too crazy, we'll just cover the basics for a moment. As Warlocks have a 1d8 hit die, we'll begin with eight hit points plus our constitution modifier. We'll also gain proficiency in light armor, simple weapons, wisdom and charisma saving throws, and any two skills out of Arcana, Deception, History, Intimidation, Investigation, Nature, and Religion. As far as equipment, we'll be granted either a light crossbow with 20 bolts or any simple weapon, a component pouch or an arcane focus, a scholar's pack or a dungeoneer's pack, leather armor, any simple weapon, and two daggers. Now we get to have some fun. Unlike most classes in D&D, we'll get to choose our subclass right off the bat when we make a deal with an otherworldly patron at level 1. To start, regardless of the type of patron we choose, this deal will grant us pack magic as we channel the power of the one we are beholden to. This feature is distinctly different from the spellcasting feature, so be sure to keep that in mind when you inevitably get into multiclassing with Warlock. Regardless of what you call it, Pact Magic will grant your Warlock two cantrips of your choice from the Warlock spell list, and will start you out with a single first level spell slot so you can cast two spells that you know at this point. And as a rule of thumb as you level up, you can learn spells no higher in level than the maximum level for which you have a spell slot, but you can also swap one of those spells out for another Warlock spell each time you level up. Here's a graph of those spells and spell slots so we don't have to get too muddy down in specifics. Notice anything odd? Experienced players and spellcasters may notice that the number of spell slots a Warlock gets doesn't advance much over the life of your character, with one slot to start at level 1 and just two slots to use all the way to 11th level. So how the heck does that make Warlocks broken? <laughs> You simpleton, 
You have yet to scratch the surface of my power. <laughs> well said. You see, these spell slots may not be many, but they are powerful, as they all level at the same rate, giving you the opportunity to upcast old spells, learn newer and more powerful ones, and get those slots back on a short rest. Yes, that's right. You'll get your Warlock spell slots all back on a short rest. It's just one more reason that multi-classing into Warlock from another spellcasting class can be a nice option for many builds. As far as what low-level spells you should consider here, it's hard to go wrong with Armor of Agathis, Hex, Mind Spike, or Mirror Image. Hex in particular is known to be a pretty solid staple of Warlock builds, especially at low tiers of play. As a bonus action, this spell will allow you to curse a creature within 90 feet and subsequently deal an extra 1d6 necrotic damage whenever you hit it with an attack. That curse target will also have disadvantage with any ability you choose when you cast the spell, and you can move the hex to a new target as a bonus action if the first one dies before the spell ends. It is concentration, but you'll have it for up to an hour now and possibly even longer if you upcast it, making it pretty nice bang for buck considering it just takes one of your spell slots. But even still, just one to two spell slots for 10 levels of gameplay hardly seems manageable, right? Well, that's where your cantrips come in. You'll only get two to start, so you're definitely gonna wanna be smart about what you take here, and on most builds, your first choice is going to be Eldritch Blast, the quintessential Warlock cantrip. But you may also wanna consider Mind Sliver, Minor Illusion, or even Mage Hand. Now, it is entirely possible to create a great Warlock without using Eldritch Blast, but I'd say nine out of 10 times, it's better to have it than not, because it's just that good. On its own, you'll get a pretty great attacking option that hits for 1d10 force damage from 120 feet away. That alone is pretty nice, especially when you consider the way that this cantrip scales as multiple beams and not just extra damage. I tend to like this better since the attack doesn't hang on a single roll like Firebolt does. And don't forget that this scaling occurs based on character level and not class level, keeping it fairly viable for those one level dips into the class. But there's a reason this works even better for our Warlock and makes Eldritch Blast one of the most broken cantrips in the game. Don't get ahead of yourself, mortal. You are still beholden to me. Right, that starts to come online at second level, so let's take a moment to cover those subclass options for our Warlock patron. Each one will offer you an expanded spell list for choosing new spells as you level up, as well as other abilities that come online at first, sixth, 10th and 14th level, and I'll do my best to touch briefly on each, but I'll leave the finer details of these contracts to future videos that I'll link as we go along. Our first option, the Archfey Patron, allows you to strike a deal with a Lord or Lady of the Fey. These beings tend to be a bit unpredictable and even whimsical at times, so you'll get access to extra spells like Fairy Fire, Blink, Greater Invisibility, and Dominate Person to name a few. Unlike other options for your Warlock, this Fae-themed subclass seems to focus mostly on clever use of illusions and enchantments to get the upper hand against your enemies. Even at just first level, you'll gain the ability to try and charm or frighten creatures within a 10-foot cube originating from you. Later gaining abilities to turn invisible and teleport away as a reaction, become immune, and potentially reflect charm effects from enemies, and eventually plunge a creature into an illusory realm of your own design for a minute. Although this is just the first subclass we'll cover, the Archfey Patron offers some really fun and unique flavor, especially for players creative enough to use the spell list effectively and efficiently alongside that fantastic teleport that I mentioned earlier. It's decent for combat, yes, of course, but also offers some tremendously useful flexibility for social encounters. Next, the Celestial subclass will offer an interesting bond with the Upper Plains. Though Warlocks are traditionally seen as something a bit darker and malicious, this option provides an interesting change of pace that your party's Cleric or Paladin might actually approve of. As you serve the light, you'll be granted access to an expanded spell list that includes great entries like Guiding Bolt, Revivify, Wall of Fire, and Guardian of Faith. Although Guiding Bolt will fall off in later levels as your Eldritch Blast becomes more powerful as a cantrip, it can be good as an early option, and the ability to become somewhat of an impromptu healer for your party is certainly a welcome deviation from the norm. On top of that, you'll get the Light and Sacred Flame cantrips for free at first level, and although they aren't particularly useful, I find it can be a nice touch for flavor at least. 
Continuing on with the theme of light and healing, you'll gain celestial power that allows you to heal your allies at range as a bonus action, similar to Healing Word, increase the damage of spells that deal radiant or fire damage while becoming resistant to radiant damage yourself, grant temporary hit points to yourself as well as your allies at the end of a short or long rest, and even cheat death by regaining half of your hit points and dealing damage to enemies within 30 feet of you in the process. This subclass definitely helps you tick all the caster boxes and can be outright broken in some games, even though your mileage may vary depending on your party composition. There are lots of reasons to love this one, least of all for its atypical warlock flavor. We now arrive at the Fathomless Warlock as we move from the light of the upper plains to the dark depths of the ocean. As a servant to some otherworldly power dwelling in the elemental plane of water, you'll unlock the potential for powerful spells like Create or Destroy Water, Silence, Control Water, and Bigby's Hand to name a few. And starting at first level, you'll be able to magically summon a 10 foot long tentacle within 60 feet of you as a bonus action that attacks your enemies for you, regardless of if you're on land or sea. And you'll even gain a 40 foot swim speed and the ability to breathe underwater. In later levels, you'll gain resistance to cold damage and the ability to speak to and understand other creatures while fully submerged, the ability to use your tentacle to protect yourself and your allies, spawn a field of smaller tentacles via a free casting of Avard's black tentacles once per long rest, and you'll even be able to teleport yourself and your allies as an action up to a mile away to a body of water that you've seen. This might not be the strongest pick for a campaign that mostly takes place on land, but even then, I think it can hold its own pretty well, and it's absolutely fantastic for any water-based adventures or encounters. Finally, we come to the Fiend Patron, one of the most on-brand Warlock subclasses that has been available since 5e was released. And surprisingly, it still holds up really well with the plethora of newer options. As you might imagine, this deal is initiated with some manner of demon or devil that has granted you access to many damage dealing and combat based abilities and an expanded spell list including very heavy hitters like Burning Hands, Command, Fireball, and Wall of Fire among other very blasty entries. And those couple really well with your first level ability called Dark One's Blessing that bestows to you a number of temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier plus your warlock level when you kill a hostile creature. And the good things continue later as you gain the ability to add a d10 to ability checks and saving throws, gain resistance to any chosen damage type when you finish a long or short rest, and literally hurl your enemies through hell, dealing 10d10 psychic damage in the process. This patron has been a staple in the Warlock meta since 5e was introduced and it's still a go-to of mine, even among all the newer options. Speaking of new options, thanks to Tasha, we can now choose a genie as our patron, but we're not quite done there. Unlike the other patrons, the type of genie you choose will reflect certain aspects of your abilities as a warlock. Those types correspond to the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. As you'd expect, each type of genie changes your expanded spell list to some extent, but you'll always gain access to certain entries like Phantasmal Force, Phantasmal Killer, Creation, and Wish. That's right, this subclass will give your warlock access to the Wish spell. That alone should be enough to convince you that this subclass can get pretty broken, even if you are waiting until the very late game for it. But that's not all, because some of the abilities you get from your genie patron are damned good as well. Beginning at first level, you'll gain a tiny vessel such as an oil lamp or a ring that you can disappear into as an action, or you can deal extra damage on an attack once per turn. The damage type, of course, will depend on the type of genie that you chose. From there, you'll eventually gain resistance to a damage type once again corresponding to your genie, a flying speed as a bonus action, the ability to invite other willing creatures into your vessel, to decrease the time needed for a short rest to just 10 minutes while adding some extra healing to any hit dice they use, and finally, you may gain a free casting of any 6th level spell as an action by simply speaking to your genie's vessel. It's been a little while since this was released as part of Tasha's, but I haven't seen all that many people using it. And that's really a shame because this subclass is definitely one of the most broken out there. Expect a build with this one from me sometime soon. Now, moving all the way back to our last option from the player's handbook, we have the Great Old One. No, this isn't referring to the age of this subclass or some old guy. Patrons of these kinds of warlocks hail from the furthest reaches of the universe, the Far Realm. 
You've somehow gleaned the unknowable secrets of beings like Cthulhu and are now a servant to a master whose motivations are unfathomable to you. But you've at least got a pretty fantastic expanded spell list with some Lovecraftian themes like Dissonant Whispers, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, Ivard's Black Tentacles, and Dominate Person, to name a few. But beyond that, at first level, you'll gain the ability to telepathically speak to nearby creatures without a shared language and, later, features that allow you to impose disadvantage on an attack against you and possibly grant advantage on your next attack, shield your thoughts from mind reading, gain a psychic resistance that reflects that damage onto your attacker as well, and enthrall another humanoid's mind, effectively charming them until the effect is ended. Now, I have to say, this one is a little disappointing to me. I think the Great Old One is a good patron to choose in terms of flavor and can really come in handy in certain campaigns and encounters, but many of their features and spells seem to offer abilities that either the base warlock already has access to or are just too niche to get used often. Still, like most warlock subclasses, this one isn't a terrible one or two level dip for a multi-class since it could get you a pretty neat telepathic ability and a couple of great battlefield control spells at just level one. But now we arrive at a major fan favorite in the Hexblade subclass. As a warlock of this variety, you've sworn yourself to a mysterious entity from the Shadowfell that has granted you powers that manifest from weapons wreathed in darkness. And although the expanded spell list that this patron provides is somewhat on theme for a warlock that finds themselves more often in the fray of melee combat, it does leave something to be desired. You'll get access to spells like Shield, Blur, Blink, and Cone of Cold, but most of these might not be the type of spells that you'll want to be blowing your very limited Warlock spell slots on. That's not to say that these aren't useful when you need them, it's just something to keep in mind. But I should also mention the first level features that you get as a Hexblade Warlock. Starting with Hexblade's Curse, you'll be able to choose a creature within 30 feet against which you can do extra damage, land more critical hits, and regain hit points when they're killed. From there, you'll also gain proficiency in medium armor, shields, and martial weapons, and use your charisma instead of your strength or dexterity for attack and damage rolls with a weapon you're proficient with that lacks the two-handed property. And that's just level one. This gets even better if you've taken the Pact of the Blade Warlock feature at third level. Mortal. But we'll cover that later. In subsequent levels, you'll be able to summon a specter to fight alongside you when you fell an enemy, potentially force a miss when a Hexblade cursed creature attacks you if you roll a 4 or higher on a d6, regardless of what they rolled, and eventually gain the ability to move your Hexblade's curse to a new creature within 30 feet of you when the previous one is killed. All this combined with an expanded spell list that admittedly isn't the best might not seem like much on the surface, but when you really crunch the numbers and look at exactly what all these abilities do for you, how they combine with Pact of the Blade and the flexibility afforded to you by only needing to rely on your Charisma score for both ranged attacks and up-close attacks with your Hexblade weapon, you'll see why this is one of the most broken options for a Warlock build, let alone D&D in general, even in situations where you're looking to try a bit of multiclassing. And now, let's have an unfortunate look at the Undying Patron. You serve a being who has unlocked the secrets of immortality, distinctly without the need for lichdom. Powerful patrons like Vecna count themselves in this number and can offer you an expanded spell list that fits the bill, but doesn't necessarily pay them, if you know what I mean. Some notable entries here are False Life, Silence, Speak with Dead, and Contagion, but that's really all I'd even consider spending my Warlock spell slots on, and that's really saying something since not all of these are great options either. As far as the subclass features, at first level you'll gain the Spare the Dying cantrip, advantage on saving throws against disease, and a very, very niche and specific resilience to undead that forces them to target someone else if they fail a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC, when attacking you. This already isn't great, but then on top of that, they're immune to this effect for 24 hours after succeeding the save. Yuck. <laughs> it does get marginally better as we go along in later levels with the ability to regain hit points when you succeed on a death save or save someone else with Spare the Dying. We also get a feature that allows you to age much slower than normal and to survive without air, food, water, or sleep, and eventually you can reattach severed limbs and regain 1d8 plus your warlock level and hit points as a bonus action once per short or long rest. Yikes. I really don't like this one. And I've used it before in a multi-class build on this channel, but it was really only for the flavor of the character. 
there's not much here mechanically that I like over other subclass options that are so incredibly fantastic. If you're really interested in going this route, maybe talk to your DM about some changes to the subclass, like increasing the amount of healing you get, or the number of uses you have for them. Perhaps even make the Undying Warlock immune to exhaustion outright, or you could just use this next subclass instead. After that, you might not want to explore our final entry in the Undead Warlock, but I promise, this one is better. Introduced in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, this subclass gets right what the Undying subclass missed as far as I'm concerned. And unlike our previous listing, these patrons are distinctly undead and comprised largely of liches. Right away, we're given a much better expanded spell list with options like Bane, Phantasmal Force, Greater Invisibility, and Anti-Life Shell that certainly carry a bit more weight. Also at first level, we'll gain the ability to transform ourselves as a bonus action for a minute, granting us some temporary hit points, the chance to frighten a creature once per turn when we hit it with an attack, and immunity to the frightened condition. As we progress through our Warlock levels, we'll also be able to survive without eating, drinking, or breathing, in addition to an ability that we can use once per turn to change an attack's damage to necrotic and potentially roll an extra damage die. From there, we'll gain resistance to necrotic damage and immunity when we're transformed, an ability that triggers when we fall in combat, bringing us to one hit point instead, and damaging each creature of our choice within 30 feet as we take a level of exhaustion, and eventually a spirit projection feature that allows us to separate from our body for an hour or until our concentration is broken, to gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, cast conjuration and necromancy spells without verbal, somatic, and material components, gain a flying speed equal to our walking speed with hover, move through objects as if they were difficult to rain, and heal from the carotid damage dealt while transformed. There's a lot to unpack with this one, so I'll avoid going into too much more detail, but if you're looking for some manner of immortal flavor to your warlock or patron, it's a safe bet that you should use this and not the undying subclass. So now that we're done with level one, we can move on, right? Wait. The contract has not yet been fulfilled. I sense that some of these viewers have not yet liked the video and subscribed to the channel. Oh, I'm sure they'll take care of that soon. And while they do, let's talk about Eldritch Invocations and what they can do for us. These serve as powerful boosts to your character's damage, armor class, abilities, and more. And they allow you to be really effective about cherry picking the abilities that work best for the build you're trying to make. And starting at level two, we get to pick out two of them. As of recording this video, there are about 50 different ones to choose from. So again, I won't be able to go over all of these and I'll save that for a future video that I'll link here when I make it. But for now, let's have a closer look at some that you should consider. Agonizing Blast, Armor of Shadows, Repelling Blast, and Devil's Sight are all fantastic options with no prerequisites, so you can take them as early as second level and they work consistently well with most builds. With Agonizing Blast allowing you to add your Charisma modifier to the damage roll of each Eldritch Blast that you land, Armor of Shadows giving you the ability to cast Mage Armor on yourself at will for free, Repelling Blast allowing you to move those you hit with your Eldritch Blast 10 feet away on each hit, and Devil's Sight allowing you to see in non-magical and magical darkness out to a distance of 120 feet, you'll get a major upgrade no matter what you might choose at this point. As I mentioned, there are a ton of invocations available, and even more potential combinations for some crazy battlefield tactics, so let me know in the comments what some of your favorites are. After pondering the many, many options available to you up to this point for building the exact type of warlock that you want, you'll be faced with another choice at level 3 your Pact Boon. This boon can take several forms, but is ultimately a gift from your patron for your reliable servitude that can propel your character well beyond what's typical for third level builds. And thankfully, if you have even a basic idea as to what you want out of your character, this choice should be fairly simple. Your first option, the Pact of the Blade, allows you to create a weapon in your hand as an action. And since you're automatically proficient with it, you can use whatever type of weapon you want each time you summon it. This weapon will disappear if it's more than five feet away from you for a minute, but that'll still allow some shady salesman shenanigans if you'd like to try and make a quick buck in town. And this pack boon is perfect for Hexblade Warlock, as it allows you to use any weapon type for your build, including those with the two-handed property. But what if you find a super sweet magic weapon that you want to use instead? 
Well, no worries. You can conduct a one hour ritual to make that weapon your packed weapon with all the same benefits as before. Even if you aren't going Hexblade Warlock for your build, this can be a really strong option for your Warlock. Moving on, we have a relatively unassuming entry in the Pact of the Chain. This boon grants you the Find Familiar spell that you can cast as a ritual and allows your summoned familiar to take the form of an imp, pseudo dragon, quasit, or a sprite, in addition to the other typical options. All of these options bring something unique to the table, but most notably the quasit and the imp both have the ability to become invisible and to shape change into creatures with flying and swimming speeds, making them pretty great scouts for your party. Additionally, when you take the attack action, you can choose to give up one of your attacks for your familiar to make an attack instead, but it's likely that you won't be doing that too often, given their less than stellar combat stats. Still, don't underestimate the Pact of the Chain as a great choice for creative players that like to scheme their way around tricky situations. We now come to the Pact of the Tome, the last option presented in the original Warlock of the Player's Handbook. With this, we are presented with a Book of Shadows from our patron that allows us to learn three cantrips from any spell lists in the game, and they become Warlock spells for us. For builds that aim mostly to be ranged casters, this can be a formidable pick. And with cantrips like Vicious Mockery, Mage Hand, and Guidance, you can add a ton of support and versatility to your Warlock, and those are only a few of the choices you can make. Now last, we have the Pact of the Talisman, the most recent entry from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This relatively simple option grants us an amulet that the wearer can activate to roll a d4 and add the resulting number to their roll on a failed ability check. We can do this a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus, but this feature only resets after a long rest. Newer is not always better here. This boon could have been more useful if the d4 could be applied to more than just ability checks, but most often I'd find it just as effective to take the Pact of the Tome and choose Guidance as one of your three cantrips. Sure, you'll have to cast Guidance as an action and not in reaction to a bad roll, but I find most of the time a check is made, it's made with enough time to premeditate a casting like that. And so it's at this point that we move on to level 4, which would normally be a chance for a new cantrip, spell known, and likely an ability score improvement to help max out our charisma score. But with Tasha's, we did also get an optional class feature here called Eldritch Versatility. This feature does what you might expect and just adds a bit of flexibility to your build each time that you would get an ability score improvement by allowing you to replace a cantrip from your packed magic, replace your packed boon with another, or replace a spell from your mystic arcanum feature that we'll touch on in just a moment after level 12 with another warlock spell of the same level. And if any of those changes make you ineligible for an invocation you took, you can change that too. Really, there's not a whole lot to say here, but I do find it interesting that you might be able to leverage this into being able to optimally jump between different packed boons as you level to help fill gaps in your party and to play to whatever strengths are necessary for your group's success. At the very least, if you change your mind about your build or accidentally pick up something you regret, it's nice to have an optional feature to change it up. And as you swap things in and out in an effort to build the best version of Warlock that you can, you may want to consider trying out Hunger of Hadar, Banishment, Dimension Door, and Hold Monster. Again, your mileage may vary, but these are a few of my favorites from over the years. From this point, you'll mostly continue picking up features from your subclass, new cantrips, spells, and invocations until 11th level whenever you unlock your first bout of Mystic Arcanum. This is an ability that allows us to cast spells above 5th level through the use of our patron's power once per long rest, since warlocks never actually gain spell slots for anything above that. It does this by allowing us to select a single 6th level spell that we are then allowed to cast once per long rest without using any spell slots. We'll also gain access to 7th, 8th, and 9th level spells in this way at 13th, 15th, and 17th level respectively, keeping us pretty well on pace with the potency of the wizard in that regard. And if we're playing a genie warlock with the wish spell, that becomes even more true. So what spells should you select from the base warlock spell list for these four highly contested slots? Well, a lot of that is really going to depend on your build, and it's hard to narrow all of the options down into just four choices. So I won't. <laughs> there are a ton of great picks this deep in the Warlock spell list, but some of my personal favorites are Mental Prison, Soul Cage, Crown of Stars, Feeble Mind, Foresight, and Imprisonment. 
And as I mentioned before, you'll also have various opportunities for some more Eldritch invocations for your a la carte warlock ability. So you may want to consider Sculptor of Flesh for Polymorph once per long rest, Shroud of Shadow for endless castings of invisibility at will, Eldritch Mind for advantage on all of your concentration checks, and Eyes of the Runekeeper. So you can read literally any writing and warlock your way through those pesky puzzles your DM keeps giving you. Finally, at level 20, we arrive at the capstone ability for Warlock called Eldritch Master, which allows us to spend just one minute speaking to our patron to regain all of our spell slots that would normally come back over a short rest. We can only use this feature once per long rest, and admittedly, it's not nearly as potent as some other capstones in the game. However, it's useful enough that you may not mind it, and the Warlock is powerful enough up to this point that it may not feel necessary for an additional buff. After all, you've sold your soul for one of the best cantrips in Eldritch Blast, some of the best subclasses in the game, an incredibly potent spellcasting mechanic that plays even better into multi-class builds, and some of the best flavor in all of the player options for 5e, combining to form this wildly powerful and sometimes broken Warlock class and all it cost you was that one measly soul. If you'd like to sell your soul one last time, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more builds, guides, and live sessions. And until next time, go out there and make some chaos.